Well, hello, hello, and welcome to Viking Guitar University. This is the first video in the home recording arm of our school, the others being playing guitar and guitar maintenance. The uh, home recording side is going to teach you everything you need to know about how to do home audio recording. Now, this is one of those things where if you've put any time looking into this already, you probably know you can spend a, a lot of money on this stuff. Um, that is part of the reason why these tutorials are free. Uh, at the same point, though, you don't have to spend a lot of money, because without the knowledge of how to use this stuff, you could buy every gadget and gizmo and software plugin and everything in the world, and if you don't know what you're doing with it, it's still going to sound like crap. On the flip side, a lot of the time you can choose cheaper solutions, um, cheaper products, or some things that are even free in, on the software side, and if you know how to use them properly, you can get some very impressive sounds. So that's kind of the emphasis of what we're doing cost-effective, good-sounding solutions. So without wasting any more time, let's jump into the equipment you're going to need to get started. First off, you're going to need a computer. Now, you don't want something super old. The newer, the better, for the most part. Um, can be either Windows-based or uh, OS X-based Macintosh. Um, I don't have any experience with Linux, so don't even ask. Uh, mainly, you want a robust processor, you want a lot of hard drive space, either in the computer or on an external hard drive, and you want a good amount of RAM. Um, doing music production really is fairly intensive on the computer, and we're dealing with a lot of memory and moving a lot of stuff around, so all those things are important. Don't worry about a graphics card, don't worry about having a super awesome internet connection, don't worry about having even a dedicated sound card built into the computer, because we're going to look to a different place for that. So memory, RAM, hard drive space, and processor speed. Second thing you're going to need is something that you want to record. Now this could be anything. I am Viking Guitar. This is a guitar. So you can put two and two together and guess what I spend most of my time recording. But it could be anything. It could be anything that you can record with a microphone, like a human voice singing or speaking for a podcast, um, a trumpet, a flute, a drum set, a MIDI drum set, a MIDI keyboard, anything. We're going to focus on all that stuff. So you've got your computer, you've got your thing to record. The third thing you're going to need is a way to get that signal, that sound, from the real world into the computer. Now, this is called an input device. There are a lot of different options. You can spend a lot of money on these or spend a little bit of money. Um, this guy right here, the Line 6 GX is a very cost-effective solution. It's something I recommend if you're just getting started with this. It's got one input for a guitar. It's got a control knob here. On the output, it's got your USB, which goes to the computer, and it's got a headphone line out jack, and that is it. Um, things you might want to look for are the um, multiple inputs if you want to record multiple uh, instruments simultaneously. Um, maybe some onboard mixing stuff if you want to do that. The possibility to run headphones as well as um, line outs to speakers if you want to have a monitor set up or a subwoofer or something like that. And uh, the big thing is that you want this thing to be able to function as a sound card. And a lot of them do, but if you're in the market looking for one, just ask the retailer if it's ASIO, audio, stream, input, output, something like that. But basically what it does is it's a way of bypassing all of the internal computer stuff that an audio signal usually has to go through, which normally is fine if you're just playing a game on your computer or watching YouTube or something, like you probably are right now. Um, but if you're doing multi-layer audio production, all that will get bogged down through the computer's sound card. So having a dedicated sound card is great, and the reason I said don't buy one in your computer is because it's just as easy to get one as this little input device here, much cheaper, and um, that's what I recommend. If you don't have that, there's another way we can do it with the software component um, for the ASIO stuff, but we'll get into that later. So you've got your computer, You've got your thing to record, whether it's a guitar or a dog barking or the sweet sound of the wind blowing through the willow tree in your front yard one autumn eve. Um, you have your input device, and all that does at this point is get the sound into the computer. Now what we need is something in the computer that we can use to manipulate that sound. This is called a DAW. That stands for Digital Audio Workstation. Um, you've probably heard of these before if you haven't heard the term. Pro Tools. Sonar, Fruity Loops, Reaper, um, K2, 
cakewalk. There's there's a lot of them out there, and once again, they run the gamut in price. The one we're going to be focusing on right now is Reaper. Reaper is great because it's free to download um, in trial version. It's a 30-day fully functional trial without any hindrances like not letting you save or only let you letting you hear 30 seconds of it or some BS like that. Um, after the 30 days are up, at least as far as I'm sure, it doesn't force you to buy the software or shut down. It just has a small nag screen when you turn on saying, hey, why don't you buy it if you're still using it? And if you do decide to buy it, it's very, very reasonably priced. I'm not going to give you specific numbers because they might change by the time you're watching this video, but I purchased my Reaper license for under $100, which is pretty damn good. Um, so once again, a DAW, it's going to let you have multiple audio files running at the same time. It's going to let you use software plugins to do mixing and modification, cut them up, splice them up, all that stuff, and then render it down to an MP3 file or a WAV file or something like that that you can actually burn onto a disk or put on your iPod or send to someone through email, something like that. So we've got our computer, we've got our thing to record, we've got our input device, we've got our DAW, and the last thing you're going to need is something to listen to the music with. Um, this thing, it's got one output jack that it has as line out and headphones. That's fine. It all depends on what you're going for. If you want to be doing studio quality, like high quality stuff, I really recommend getting um, an input device that allows you to have dedicated left and right line outs um, and then uh, get a um, a good set of studio monitors. And once again, those those can be really expensive, but this is the one place where I'm pretty adamant you do get what you pay for with the studio monitors. If you're just making music that you want to record for the fun of it, just so you can have fun playing music, there's nothing wrong with that. And actually, that's probably a much more frustration-free path. But um, if you want to have high quality stuff, like super high quality, you really need to be able to hear the full sonic spectrum. Studio monitors are the way to go. I also recommend getting a subwoofer if you can do that and if your thing supports it. On the flip side though, if you just want to plug in a set of headphones and listen to it, you can do all your audio editing with that. It won't provide you with the full EQ range. It won't be necessarily representative of how the song is going to sound on different audio systems, but it'll get the job done. You can listen to it while you're doing it. You can do all your editing properly, and there you go. So, five things. Computer, thing that makes sound, input device, digital audio workstation, and headphones or speaker setup. Those are all the hardware components you're really going to need, except for the, you know, the little cables and stuff right there. So without further ado, we're going to jump into the first part of this, and that's how to download Reaper and how to get all the software that we're going to work with to get started recording your first song. The first thing we're going to do is download Reaper. Now, as you can see, I'm using a Windows-based system here, but the same websites apply for uh, OS X. Um, you want to open up your internet browser and go to reaper.fm. That'll bring you to this page here. It's the home page for Reaper. And the easiest way to download it is to just go up to this button here, click download. It'll bring you to the download screen. Scroll down and just select your operating system and click the download button. One thing I'd like to mention, with the Windows things here, if you're deciding between 32-bit and 64-bit, um, if you have the option to run 64-bit, I recommend it because it lets you use a bit more processor power um, in some situations. If you're not sure which version your computer is, go to the Start menu, right-click on the computer, go to Properties, and it should show right here 64-bit operating system order 32-bit operating system. So you can close that guy out. Just click on the Download button walk through the download instructions, and then you have Reaper. Now, the next thing you're going to want is ACO for all, but that's only if you have a, uh, an input device that doesn't act as its own ACO sound card. Um, if you don't have that, you need to download this, which is a software component. And like I said uh, before, ACO, audio stream input output, basically lets your computer sounds bypass a lot of the operating system stuff that get in the way of things. So download that go through the install instructions. The last thing you might need are um, a couple of files called uh, Lame Enc DLL. And basically what that does is it lets you in Reaper um, render things down to MP3. Now rendering is the process of taking your project and making a single file that can be played, usually a WAV or an MP3 file. But if you want to make an MP3, you'll need Lame Inc. And there are a few places to get it, but I have it up at www.vikingguitaruniversity guitaruniversity.com slash downloads slash lame dll 
If you just go there, it'll download the file, and what you want to do is copy that and put it in your Reaper folder. Now for me, that's C colon backslash program files backslash Reaper 64. And if you see in here, there's Lamenc and Lamenc 64, which is a 64-bit version. Both of the files are available at vikinguitaruniversity.com under the downloads. Just put in lamenc.dll or lame underscore inc 64.dll and download those. Once you've got Reaper installed, ACO4 installed if you need it, and uh, the lame ink in the Reaper folder, you can close out your browser and open up Reaper. And when you open up Reaper the first time, you're going to see something like this. And probably right off the bat, you're going, okay, what is all this? And that's fine. Um, we're going to... We're going to go over all this, but for right now, don't worry about any of it. There's a lot going on, but first, we just need to set up a few things in Reaper. So we're going to start by going to Options, going down to Preferences. And as you can see, there's a lot of different preferences to use here, but we're going to start up at General, go down to Paths, and you can set a few paths here if you want to. Now, paths, of course, are just the default directories where Reaper looks for things and where Reaper puts things. Um, you can set a default path for where you want files to render to when you render them. Um, you can set a, a default path for where it holds your temporary recording files, other stuff like that. We're not going to worry about any of the rest of this stuff for right now, except scrolling all the way down and under this plugins heading, there's a VST thing. Click on that, and you, this text bar right here, you want to type in the path of where you have all of your VST plugins, if you already have some. If not, you want to create a folder where you're going to be putting plugins as we download them throughout, and then just type that folder in there. Um, what plugins are are all of your effects and your mixing tools and stuff like that, and Reaper know, needs to know where to look for those. So just put that path in there, click OK. The only other thing you want to do is go to the file menu, go down to project settings, and under media, you want to go down to this recording section here. Now, audio format for new recordings, you want to make sure that's at wave, and under wave bit depth, you want to select kind of the biggest one that runs decently with your computer, and some of that might be trial and error. Just as a frame of reference, 16-bit wave depth is the quality of a standard CD. 8-bit is less than that. 24, 32, and 64 are obviously higher. Now, if we are going to burn this to a CD when we're done with it, it's going to be mixed down to 16-bit anyway. But I like to go higher at the front end, and then we can deal with any quality loss later instead of already embedding that quality loss. Now what this is, is when you record files in Reaper, it creates these wave recordings for it. And so this is just setting up what quality of the recorded files you have. So click OK when that's done. And now Reaper is pretty much set up for how you want it to be. Now, we'll just look at a few things first. Um, we're not going to do any recording this time. That's going to be on the next one. But just to give you a bit of a layout of how Reaper works, um, up here we have a toolbar that has various buttons for new project, opening project, saving a project, um, project settings, undo, redo. This is a metronome that you can turn on and off. And the metronome up here is going to link down to the beats per minute down here. If you want to change the beats per minute, just double, uh, just click on it and you can type in whatever you want. Or you can hover over the BPM button and it changes to tap. And as you tap your mouse, it'll set the beats per minute automatically to however fast you're tapping. So the metronome will turn on and off that. So when we play this, it has a metronome at that speed, and if we set it faster, it's faster. Like that. If you right click on the metronome button here, you can bring up settings for it, where you can tell it how loud you want the metronome to be, how loud you want the secondary beat to be, and then a few other things about it. You can set up a count in before playback, if you want a four or an eight count before you start um, playing, and same thing with recording. So we'll close that out, we'll turn off the metronome. The only other button um, that I really want to show you right now is this snapping button here, um, this little magnet symbol. If you click on snapping, as you move items around here, it'll automatically snap to the edges of other items and to the grid, which may or may not be a useful thing for what you want. This big blank space over here is going to cover where all your individual tracks are, so if you have a guitar line, if you have a bass line, drums, vocals, each one will show up as an individual track there, like that. Over here is the grid. Um, it creates this little shading thing for each track, which is nice, and then uh, up here are the beats per minute, or not the beats per minute, but the measures, and then the actual time. So this mark right here is at 17 measures at the first beat, and it's also at 20 seconds into the song. 
Now, if we hover over here and use our mouse wheel up and down, we can zoom in and out on the scope so we can get really finite. Like this is the distance here between, uh, this is bar 16 first beat, second beat, third beat, fourth beat, up to there. And then if we scroll down here, you don't even see that close. So that's all this stuff over here. Obviously you can move around as you need to. Down here we have our playback features. This is the beginning of the project, stop button, play button, the pause button, end of the project. This is the record button. And this turns on if you want things to repeat. Now, if you turn on the repeat, it'll repeat the project from beginning to end, or you can click here and drag and just end up repeating a highlight segment there. We'll close that out. Um, down here, this just shows where you are based on where the cursor is. As we move around, that'll change. And once again, it's what measure or bar you're on and then what time you're on. Um, this rate thing over here is gonna let you um, play bit things back slower or faster without changing the tempo. And then down here is our mixer section. This is called the docker. It starts with the main master bus. This is a volume meter that's gonna show how loud things are for the overall thing and allow you to do panning and stuff like that. And then each one of these here corresponds to one of the tracks up here. So as I delete these tracks, you can see that the corresponding mixer component at the bottom goes away. To create a new track, you can just click in here and go to insert, uh, or track rather, and insert new track. One shows up. Or you can click in here and hit Control T, or you can just double click and a new track will show up. Now we'll delete all these guys. On a track itself, there are a few things you can do, and we can shift this over and move this down a bit. Track over here, this is the recording arm button. Now, when we have a track, if we set the recording armed and then click record, it'll start creating audio in this track. This blank space over here is the title. You can double click in it and put first track or whatever you want. Um, this is uh, the input and output routing, which is something we're gonna get to later. Don't worry about it. This is the volume. This is the panning for how far left or right you want it to be. If you double click on this, it'll bring it back to center. And with the volume, you can move it all around, but if you double click, it brings it back to zero. This here is just a volume meter that's gonna play while the track is actually generating sound. This is the option to mute this track or solo this track, which mutes all the others. And the only other thing we're gonna look at right now is uh, two things actually. Um, one is the envelopes over here, something we're gonna deal with later, but when I say envelopes, that's where the button is. And then over here, the FX button is where we'll add our different effects to the track when we want to do that later on. But for right now, we're not going to worry about that. This just turns on and off whatever effects we have. So like, let's say we have some EQ on there and let's say we also have some reverb. If we want to just turn all those tracks or effects off, we just click there, turns it off. Then we add another track, add another track, as many as we need for different instruments. And when we play it back, it'll play all of them simultaneously. By this point, you've hopefully got Reaper all set up. Um, the reason I haven't given you any information on how to set up your input device is because there are so many different types out there, I really don't know what it is you're using, and uh, I can't give specific advice on something I don't know about. So refer to the instructions that came with it. Um, whichever product it is, we'll probably have an online forum if you're having trouble. The main thing is, is that your system recognizes the input device and that Reaper recognizes that you're using the input device while you're using Reaper. So now that you've seen a little bit about what it does and what it looks like, I know it's scary, there's a lot of buttons, but um, we're gonna go through this step by step. Be sure to tune in for the next video in which we will actually record our first song. Thanks for watching Viking Guitar University. I'm Viking Guitar, and until next time, keep the world metal.